The Catholic Church is corrupt. It's a mess. It's been a mess since its founding in 33 AD by Jesus Christ. Just a few sentences after Jesus establishes Peter as the first pope and gives him the authority and the keys to the kingdom, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You are thinking, not as God does, but as humans do. The Catholic Church has been corrupt from its early apostles, betraying him, denying him, delivering him over to the enemies, uh, having Thomas needing to see his wounds in his hands and in his sides before he would believe in the resurrection. I mean, this is a man, Thomas, who went camping with Jesus for three years straight, who really knew Jesus, but lacked true faith. Uh, the corruption of the church didn't stop there. If you look at many of the offenses of the members over the centuries, and I think about the church putting to death one of its great saints like Joan of Arc and accusing her and burning her at the stake, and condemning other saints like Padre Pio. I think about the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, where the church needed serious reform, and the Catholic Reformation following that. And the corruption continues today as we look at the sexual abuse scandals that have been about 100 years in the making, sadly bearing their fruit now. At the end of the 20th century, um, we can see such a response and such a result of secularism, of homosexuality, of rebellion against the church's stance on sexual morality. The church has gone soft and corruption is the result and corruption is the fruit. Bishop Morlino of Madison, Wisconsin says, it's time that we admit there's a homosexual subculture within the hierarchy of the church that is wreaking great devastation in the vineyard of the Lord. The sex abuse crisis has continued because the modern church has become too comfortable with sin in her teaching and practice. For too long, we've diminished the reality of sin. We've refused to call sin a sin, and we have excused sin in the name of mistaken notion of mercy. In our efforts to be open to the world, we've become all too willing to abandon the way, the truth, and the life. Now, if we look at the sexual abuse scandals of the end of the 20th century and how rampant they were through the Catholic Church and um, amongst the clergy, and these aren't even noting that the victims in the seminaries and the the older victims of sexual abuse within the church, from the hierarchy, from the seminaries, from the bishops, from the cardinals, um, working their way down. I mean, we have to look at and understand that 80% of these victims were post-pubescent boys, teenage age, 100% of the perpetrators were men. Most of them were attracted to men and other boys. And I'm not saying that gay men are more likely to abuse people, but I am saying if a gay man is an environment working closely with men and with boys, that environment is more toxic. Sin is so prevalent in this world where we do not have that discipline, we don't, do not have a high standard of sexual morality because of the corruption within the church. In his book, Goodbye Good Men, Michael Rose, he interviews hundreds of seminarians and finds a consistent theme, whereas the conservative, orthodox, Catholic seminarian going into there were rooted out because they were called too rigid and evaluated by anti-Catholic and secular psychologists and um, if they didn't agree with homosexuality or with contraception or with women priests they were considered too rigid and it became a very tough environment for these orthodox priests in certain seminaries so we find that we have so many liberal um, homosexual authorities leading these what they would call pink palaces some of these seminaries um, in Michael Go Michael Rose's book Goodbye Good Men he talks a lot about it in the rebellion within the church they rejected Vatican II and they lived in the spirit of Vatican II and they interpreted things however they wanted and they rejected the authority of the church and the hierarchy that Jesus established and that's a huge reason for so much of the corruption and why we're seeing these fruits here today. And Jesus speaks on this when he says about John the Baptist and comparing him to, to King Herod. And he says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes or soft clothes? Look, those who wear fine clothes are found in king's palaces. And he's referring to Herod and, you know, soft clothes or effeminate men. They're found in palaces and we've become too comfortable. And we think about David and Bathsheba and how David used to be a great leader and king and manly man and would go off to his troops in battle. And um, we read in the scriptures, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. 
He was supposed to be at war with his men and leading his men, and he was taking a nap. He was resting. And as a church, we become too comfortable. We become complacent. We've been soft. We have not been men. We have not been leading. And we have not been strong. But we do have hope because we do know that the gates of hell will not prevail against Jesus and his church. I love what Pope Pius VII said when he was captured by Napoleon. And Napoleon was trying to destroy the church. And Pope Pius said to him, Oh, you silly little man, you're trying to do what 17 centuries of priests and bishops have tried and failed to do. The church, it's not a hotel for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. If you find a perfect church, then don't join it. Because the moment you step through its doors, it will then become imperfect. We can't put our trust in men. Jesus says to practice and obey whatever they tell you, but don't follow their example, for they don't practice what they preach. Jesus asked the twelve apostles, Do you want to leave me too? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. So we're faced with a choice here, with amidst the corruption, amidst the dissension and the rebellion in this church, do we run and leave the church? Or do we turn, man up, and lead the church? And that's my challenge to the laity. We need to lead the church. To whom would we go? This is the church that Jesus Christ established. We must not run from it, but we must reform. Jesus came to set the world on fire and how he wishes it was already burning. We'd become too complacent, too soft, too effeminate as a church. He says, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to this earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He also said, take your money purse, take your traveler's bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Sell your dress and buy a sword because we're at battle, we're at war, and we need to man up. We need to be fierce, we need to be courageous. We need to live the gospel boldly. We have to stop being comfortable, take off our fine clothes and soft clothes and effeminate views and put on the camel skin hair like John the Baptist and, and be like him. Don't like be like him, King Herod, living in palaces, but, but be a man, be rough, be, be strong, be courageous, be fierce, be holy. The crisis in the church is the lack of holiness, the lack of men, the lack of saints, of real true warriors for Jesus Christ. The crisis in the world is a lack of saints. Evil triumphs when good men fail to do nothing. We cure the corruption in the church by curing the corruption within, by leading the church, not leaving the church, by being fierce, holy, courageous, by being saints. The crisis in the church is a lack of saints. Be who God created you to be. Set the world on fire. Be a saint. God bless you.